Okay, welcome to the last talk, the last regular talk at least in this room. Um, I think we are all somewhat in chill out atmosphere and our friend Psychoduck from the Neo Army has suggested we just chill out. Have Yo! And look a little bit into fingerprinting. Um, we heard a lot of fingerprinting just before um, and we'll now look more to the application layer. Um, we'll see some tools, see some problems, nothing groundbreaking, but there's out, there's so much stuff about fingerprinting we didn't, didn't knew um, before we looked into that problem and probably some of that you don't know and we'll show you some of the things and some of the new things we developed. Um, we promised to release our new fingerprinting engine um, at this lecture, but basically we didn't manage to pull all the code we've written on fingerprinting together, so we are re releasing a bunch of tools, um, but not the great unified solution of all application layer fingerprinting tools. You have to write that yourself. Um, okay, here we go. Um, I myself from the laboratory of dependable distributed systems um, and we all three uh, yeah, from Sprundle and um, Psychodoc um, <laughs> met at the summer school, applied IT security in Aachen which we all three and all other participants enjoyed very much. Um, and there we did several workshops and sessions and lectures on fingerprinting and wrote a lot of code and now let you participate. Um, we'll have another summer school next year which will be great fun too and if you are in interested to participate um, surf to the URL on the bottom of the slide, um, add you to the mailing list and when we'll um, know the exact date we'll send out a mailing and you can apply to be there. It's even free and fun. And a lot of work. You are expected to work around 20 hours a day for three weeks. He's uh, not lying. Yeah. <laughs> Ilya was not sleeping all the time. Okay. So, what is fingerprinting? Um, we'll have a very short look into that because we just had a lecture on f fingerprinting in this room. Um, then we'll look no, we won't look into TCP IP stack fingerprinting. I've thrown all the slides away when I saw that there's a TCP IP stack fingerprinting presentation just before ours. Um, and then we'll look into application fingerprinting, show some of the more obscure tools. All in all, application level fingerprinting isn't that well known. Everybody knows that NMAP has an um, option for TCP stack fingerprinting and there are tools like POF. Um, or Xprobe, which do TCP stack fingerprinting, but application fingerprinting is not that well known, and there are banner grabbing tools, well, but there are a lot of obscure tools. And we think application fingerprinting is more fun. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Drinking non cologne beer is so difficult. <laughs> you should all drink cologne, beer from cologne. Ah. Okay, fingerprinting. Um, there are several things to fingerprint. Um, people come to mind first. That's quite usual. IP stack fingerprinting um, is quite common too. We're looking into application fingerprinting and um, people often forget about what to fingerprint exactly. Um, you can fingerprint clients. And in fact it seems that the first approaches on <coughs> the Unix security community were fingerprinting clients um, and you can fingerprint um, servers, that's the thing most people do by doing TCP connections or connecting to mail servers or whatever. Um, what is fingerprinting at all? It's comparing features which make something identifiable. It's very seldom an exact science. Um, so, for example, the fingerprints police use of humans, um, they say there's no chance that two fingerprints are identical, but it is, and the comparison is not an exact science. You can't do just compare two images, but you have to extract which features you want to care about and which to throw away and scale that and change that. Um, so fingerprinting is always somewhat fuzzy, 
and the value of fingerprinting is in the databases to match against. Um, that's the reason when we started to use genetic fingerprinting um, in the last few years that near crime cases all somewhat suspect persons, uh, usual males, um, were asked to give genetic material to build that database and then use it for fingerprinting with um, and comparison in the fingerprinting process with genetic material um, found at the victim or something else. Um, and that's the reason why the police is keeping fingerprint databases for years now, uh, for centuries now. And that's the reason why the value in fingerprinting tools um, is very much in the databases they have to match against. That means that a private fingerprinting tool is of very little value. There's really, really good reason to make your fingerprinting tool publicly available and encourage pe people to submit additional content to the database. Okay, TCP stack fingerprinting. You've just seen that. Application fingerprinting. Um, first, the, the tool for doing application level fingerprinting by hand is SOCAT. Um, many of you might knew NetCat, um, but SOCAT is so much more feature rich and so much more logical to use. It's like if you compare um, the tool set delivered with one of the first Unix versions um, with the tools now available to a modern free Unix distribution. Um, some people came. Um, claim that NetCat is the Texas chainsaw of networking, um, then SOCAT is the Texas, um, <laughs> the, no, 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 the Swiss chainsaw of networking. If so, SOCAT is a um, Swiss army, whatever, uh, the great thing of networking. <laughs> um, it, it can really do anything which is can be um, abstracted by a file or a socket on Unix um, with PDIs and so on, you, you can really do a lot of nifty stuff. Um, the, the most simple way of fingerprinting is banner grabbing. Sometimes you don't even need a database if the banner contains the name of the server. Um, but there are more interactive approaches. Okay, banner grabbing is simple. Connect, get the response, disconnect, hope nothing breaks in that process. Interestingly, some servers break in this process because they ask you or they expect you to um, say goodbye before you disconnect, um, but such software is very seldom on the internet nowadays um, and works very nice for many protocols. For example, many people are not available that very simple banner grabbing is available for SSH. Um, so SSH is a binary protocol, no banners there. Yeah, you're right, but bef before the binary handshake starts, um, there is a clear text banner, and for some reason, programmers have a high tendency to put all kinds of information in the banner for debugging or whatever. So um, FreeBSD has a tendency to announce the exact version, even um, with the date, so you can be sure if something has to be exploited. Uh, can be still exploited or not, or is patched. Um, some people patch the um, banner to, be, to read something special. Um, some other people put in the distribution and the exact version in the Linux community. And there are even um, other things like the, all, all of the upper examples where OpenSSH um, there is SSH, the commercial version, and if you go on scanning for stuff, um, you also find some very interesting implementations you're probably not aware of, of the SSH protocol. A very nice tool for s grabbing SSH banners is SSH scan from Niels Provost. Um, who Niels Provost writes very good network programs, and SSH, uh, scan SSH is a very good implementation of that. And that's just some example of um, scanning a random network of an SDSL provider. Um, and while 
the first few SSH versions I can understand what that is. I have no idea what ASL hmm. open SSH is, and I know, don't know what the SSH protocol compatible server SCS20 is. Probably something to look into if you're looking for some usual software which wasn't um, researched that well for security vulnerabilities. So by just grabbing banners, you can find out a lot of certain protocols, even meant to be secure protocols like SSH. Um, and the other nice example is um, FTP. Well, here we have an example where NCFTP even puts the licensing in the banner. What matters that for the other side of the network? What license does a, ser a server use? But that's in there. Um, and we will find um, commercial FTP sites which have a non-commercial license in their banner and stuff like that. Um, other things identify very nicely their version. And if you are once into connecting to FTP servers before disconnecting, you might try the syst command. That's the um, first part or the first step where we leave just banner grabbing and asking for more information um, for the system. The FTP syst command doesn't deliver that nice information. So it's at, at BSD 4.4, that can be anything, nearly. Um, but at least you get some more information to understand what's running on the other side of the network connection. Um, with a wonderful um, SOCAD tool, you also can um, do a large-scale banner grabbing. Just download a few pages which contain lists of FTP servers, for example, mirror sites um, of Unix distributions. Um, use a little bit Perl, pipe that all in SOCAD, um, and you have a file with a lot of banners um, to look for interesting servers. P perhaps they are interesting because you want to look what files are on there. Perhaps they are interesting because they are obscure software you want to play with. <coughs> um, Telnet is an interesting protocol for fingerprinting uh, because it is an awful lot more complex than most people think it is. Uh, when you just tell it into things, you normally just see the username, but the things that you don't see are the more interesting. Um, when you make a talent connection, um, there's a thing um, that happens which is called session, session negotiation, which allows you to um, set an awful lot of interesting properties such as um, set environment variables or um, echo all the stuff you, you throw at them or a number of other things um, which you can just look at in the RFC. Um, because of this uh, session negotiation, um, almost any Telnet daemon will, uh, uh, or almost any Telnet daemon on different operating systems will give you um, different responses. So that makes it um, an ideal protocol for fingerprinting. Um, yes. Okay, I suppose we're first going to look at uh, banner grabbing. Oh, this is another uh, nice. Um, so cat thingy that Max made. <laughs> Maybe you should give some explanation about that because you probably understand it better I, than I do. I think that's the FTP slide and um, probably the I hit the wrong button. Yeah, or the computer fell down and the slides got mixed up or something like that. Yes, I hit the wrong button. I'm an idiot. Um, so we are first going to look at. Uh, <laughs> thank you. We are first going to look at um, uh, banner grabbing. Um, here you can see that um, if you make a simple connection to a talent server, the first thing you will get is some binary data instead of the banner. Um, if you make the connection again and you actually use Telnet, you don't see the um, ugly binary data, but you see the actual banner. <coughs> so. Um, I think that's very important to state. Many people use Telnet as a generic network connection tool, but the Telnet client utility um, does a lot of stuff behind the scenes. And you see, if you use a ge generic network connection tool like SoCat to connect to a Telnet server, you actually get completely different output 
than you get by using Telnet to connect to a Telnet port. That's something to keep in mind when playing around with Telnet. And usually Telnet clients are built in a way that if you connect to the Telnet port 23, they play Telnet protocol. Um, and if you connect to another port, they act as a Netcat emulation or something like that. Um, but keep in mind, Telnet is no generic and no 8-bit clean network connection utility. Stay away from it if you don't want to use actually Telnet protocol. Mm. Yes, here you can see again a lot of the uh, binary data which Telnet uses. And under, underneath you can see the banner or just the uh, uh, user, the string you get that asks for, you, asks for your passwords. This is a bit more of all the same. Again, the banner. Um, Okay. Um, yes, this is all about about the same stuff, I suppose. Or is there something that I'm missing? No, it's, it's just different um, between different servers. They have a very different behavior with login. Um, for example, with in this slide, I just connected and did nothing. So after 60 seconds, I get a password. Timeout expired. After another 60 seconds, too third time, um, it disconnects. Other servers wait for a password forever. So the, the behavior when just connecting between different servers is very different. Yes, which is what you can see here. <laughs> okay. That's actually my printer who has a very strange password prompt. Okay, this is uh, an interesting thing that I found a while ago. Um, this is actually in, uh, an, OS, an AS400, running OS400, that I accidentally found while crawling Google for interesting targets for Telnet fingerprinting. I think it's quite interesting. Unfortunately, um, while we were testing this thing again, because we wanted to show this on a demo, but while we were testing this uh, earlier, we noticed that um, that screen is not there, in, well, the login thing isn't there anymore. So unfortunately, we couldn't give the demo. Um, yes. Uh, the more interesting thing about the Telus protocol is that it will basically have, um, have four basic um, commands, which, will, which is will, won't, do, and don't. Um, because basically, a uh, talent protocol works um, on a, uh, where you just send a um, query and then you get a response to it. And that's the way it works until um, the entire uh, session negotiation is done, and then the banner happens and you can just do, and you just get to see the, uh, what, you, what you usually see happens then. Um, yeah. um, the Talent FP is actually a, a pretty cool uh, program written by uh, Palmers of Tesso. Um, the database is fairly old, as you can see here. Um, updating database on itself isn't that easy. I've tried a few times, and if you don't do it exactly the way it was intended, <laughs> oh, I am an idiot. <laughs> yes. Um, the, the problem is on our screen, we see the whole slide already. It's a bug. We should report that to Apple. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, as you can see here, um, the database is rather outdated. Um, and updating database isn't as easy as you would think. But eventually, uh, it works out. Um, So basically, that's just to show off that um, the database of Nmap looks more current, but then again, also, um, it's a little bit contradicting because it claims the Telnet D is from AIX uh, and the FTP daemon is from HPUX. Um, 
what might be possible, but strange combination on the same machine. Um, I, I think this machine is actually a sun, to my knowledge. Yeah, it could, um, but we know the operators. <laughs> Um, oh, I think I hit the wrong button again. No. Oh, that's <laughs> oh. <laughs> Poor Ilya has to um, show the slides I, I created and he never saw them before. Yes. <laughs> Which is kind of a problem. Okay, that, that's basically the same machine. Um, if, if you turn it to it, oh, it's an AIX. Sorry, no sun. <laughs> um, it says, says which version it is, um, but you can't deduct it with the fingerprinting tools. Um, is there a question already? I just saw something. Yeah, we could, could. Oh no, you you show me. You don't have a question. Very nice. <laughs> okay. Um, so we can see here, Telnet FP um, has already the ability to do some fuzzy kinds of matching. For example, for this machine, it has a very wide range of. Um, operating systems this might be. Um, if you're looking for strange hardware to fingerprint, usually the address ranges used by SDSL providers um, are very good for harvesting that stuff because many little bit sophisticated businesses rent an SDSL line to their offices and have some obscure equipment there um, and just go look for the biggest SDSL advertisement or um, business ADSL with fixed IP and scan that address ranges to find lots of strange stuff to fingerprint. Um, so here again we see Nmap and Telnet FP disagree heavily. Um, that's probably the problem of the Telnet FP database being extremely old. Um, what Telnet FP actually is doing, um, it checks which um, <coughs> options the server category um, says it won't accept and which one it would accept. Uh, and since you see there are a lot of options in the Telnet protocol, um, and they can even be in, seen in combinations def depending on how, what the client sends, um, there's quite a lot of space for fingerprinted. Um, this here, this actually is a part of the fingerprint database used by um, Telnet FP. Um, and you see they, they have, while the fingerprint database is very old, it has support for even quite obscure things like Linux with support for secure ID cards. Uh, I didn't know that was, Telnet was different there. Um, yes. Um. IDENT is a rather uh, simple protocol, which um, there are two tools for, apparently, to um, fingerprint. One is uh, IDENT FP by um, Detti of Synergy, and the other is um, Eldest FP, which you can find at PacketStorm. Um, the, comment, the above comment is false, by the way. Um, IDENT FP is not the last tool. <laughs> it, it can be found. It's just that, apparently, the Synergy guys have reorganized their website. Okay. okay, I got it right now. Um, this is a small example of um, when you do things manually of uh, what you get. Um, so, so many different ident servers send back very different answers to, for example, version requests. Um, we use SoCut here to um, convert be the new lines to the way um, IDENT protocol wants it. And an, an example is for um, in the third connection, um, I sent the version request, the server sent an answer, but did not disconnect. While in the first two connections, the server disconnected after it sent an answer. That's something to fingerprint on, and you still could fingerprint on the different answers seen. 
Um, for example, the fourth request now sends a quite strange and non-standard answer. Um, the University of Berlin sends a very extensive answer, um, far more we ever wanted to ask for, um, even with compile time of the software. Um, other identities, Pi identity versions do that too. And then again, this identity didn't answer at all. It just closed the connection after the version request. Right, FTP map, which is one of the tools that we've extended, so I can s tell you something about that. Um, it, was it is written by the Jedi One, which is the guy who also made pure FTPD. This is um, the way it looks like when you run it, or this is the way it used to look like uh, when you run it. Um, basically, what it'll do is it'll send out a lot of probes and just ha make hash of every reply it gets, and that's, those are the numbers that you see, and afterwards it'll match them against a huge database that it has, and it'll even do, um, it'll even detect, uh, it, it'll look for the one which, uh, which looks the most like one database. So, and the cool thing is that next to it you see um, by how much it was off. But, but in this case it was very off because this again was my poor brother printer uh, mm. and not a pure FTP on the brother yes. printer. But that was, well, I believe that it was mostly due to um, not enough fingerprints in the database. So we fixed that. I don't think we fixed it for the printer, but we fixed yeah. it for a lot of other things. Because the tool is about three years old and um, there, there was quite a lot of development in FTP demons and stuff um, in the last three years. Yes, this is uh, the way the fingerprints used to look like. Um, it was hard-coded. Um, yes, um, yeah, I will say something about that. Next slide, I suppose. Um, this, these are the um, probes that it sends. This is only but a small bit from the actual header. It sends about 150 probes when not logged in, and then it logs in or tries to log in, and sends the 150 probes again. So it sends about 300 probes. So this will make noise. Uh, this will make noise. Yes, this is the uh, update that I've made. The previous version, the one that we've described, was 0 0.4, and um, the update basically has an actual database, which is far more easy to update now. Um, it also checks um, if you can't log in, and it'll print a warning message saying that the fingerprint might be less reliable because you can't log in. Um, previously, it also had a bug um, that it would do IP version 6 and 4, regardless of your computer supporting it or not. Um, uh, yes, the um, output you got. Um, oh. That's it? No, oh, maybe a minute. Oh, we, we don't have an output of the new tool. Yes, but we have an output all of the old tool. So <laughs> the, uh, um, the output that you have, see here, the numbers, is uh, uh, fairly annoying because um, it doesn't fit on your screen. Um, that is somewhat improved and it should fit on the screen now. <laughs> so even good user interface improvements. Yes, somewhat. Um, yes, the fingerprint database uh, got doubled. Um, a few annoying bugs also got fixed. And in about 10 minutes or so, you should be able to download FTP map 0 0.5 if you're interested. Okay, um, then uh, there's SMTP scan, um, and there's a very nice paper um, describing it. Um, SMTP scan works very similar to um, FTP map. Um, we see here example output of it. Um, we will see. <laughs> okay, you start it to run. Um, against one or several domains, and that's one of the things um, which make SMTP map a quite polished uh, SMTP scan, a quite polished product. You can run it uh, against several domains at once. You can say if it should take all MX 
records from that domain or just the highest priority MX records um, to connect to and test the things. Um, and then sends a set of probes, which is defined in an, original, uh, in an external file um, by doing borderline cases in the SMTP protocol and records the return codes of the answers. It doesn't record the text in the answers, so if somebody changes this text, that doesn't help at all. It just returns the return codes. And um, to change the return codes of a server, you usually have to change a lot of the internal logic of that server. So it's not easy to defeat SMTP scan. Um, in this case, it correctly identifies these two servers. Um, SMTP scan comes with a huge database, which basically has the, the server, the name of the server and the return codes sent back, and an additional file describing the tests. These test commands are sent to the servers, and that the return codes are analyzed and compared to the database. Um, SMTP scan seems to have been integrated in Nessus, but, um, and the Nessus version seems to have even more fingerprints, but then again, it seems that the Nessus people have deactivated it or something like that. I'm not really um, into the Nessus plug-in development thing um, to understand what's happening there, but on this URL, on the Nessus CGI server, you can find an somewhat updated version of SMTP scan, at least of the fingerprint database, although it's in the nasty NS, uh, NASL, NASL language. Um, but then again, SMTP scan itself, it's in Perl, and that's not less nasty. Another thing is LPD fingerprinting, um, which is described in a paper by Phobic. Um, the problem is that how old is this paper? Five years or something like that? Uh, I think three, uh, about four years, I think. And um, it basically there's code of, uh, proof of concept code, um, but one of the problems is that it has a very tiny fingerprint database that is the complete database. Um, but it basically tests um, LPD servers, what error messages they send. Um, but it, because of the database is so small, um, it doesn't work out. And when I tested it again against my poor printer, which has an LPD server, I'm quite sure. Um, oh. Okay. Here I tested it against my poor printer. It hang. Or hung. And I had to use Control C to stop it. Okay, DNS. Um, DNS is quite interesting because it's a binary-only protocol, or next to binary-only protocol. Um, and interestingly, um, the programmers of DNS servers, or at least at certain DNS servers, have the tendency to put Easter eggs into their servers. So if you use very special queries at a server, um, you get already the version, version information back. Um, for example, if you query one of the root servers for the domain version dot bind in the um, not in the in the internet domain which is i n but in the chaos which was chaos was not developed by the chaos computer club, but this chaos was developed at the MIT as a networking standard which isn 't used that much anymore um, but if you request a test text record there you get um, the, the version information back. And while you can disable that in newer versions of bind, people just don't do, like you see, even the root servers don't have that disabled. But there are more Easter eggs. Um, the root server also gives you a list of authors of the DNS server, which is obviously something you can fingerprint on. Um, other DNS servers which try to be a replacement of the bind server thought, oh, we have to replace this functionality too, um, use other names but still have the version, uh, have strings identifying the software and the version. Um, another thing is you can use for fingerprinting um, 
the way sound files are edited. For example, the DJ, DJB DNS suite or DNS cache suite, I don't know which is the actual name, he changed it once, have a tendency to have double records in the DNS database. So for a single query, you get back two answers with the same content. Um, if that happened, you can, it happens, you can be quite sure that you have an somewhat stock set up of um, the DJ, DJB DNS suite. Um, people could remove those duplicate records by doing filtering on the DNS database before publishing them, but they usually don't do. Um, there's a nice overview from Dan Bernstein on DNS fingerprinting, and he even has, an, um, has a nice list of which fingerprints identify which DNS servers. This is implemented in Nessos one-to-one, -one. Um, and in the summer school we actually had an, one of the um, works the students had to do was write a tool which passed the web page of Dan Bernstein to get the fingerprints and then use that for fingerprinting. Um, and it, it royally pissed off the students. We aren't here to write parsers of stinky HTML. We want to hack machines. <laughs> <laughs> we, we never do such an assignment again. Um, okay. Incidentally, one of the guys from CCC who was there as well did do this and he made a pretty cool Perl script for it. Yeah, but I think we forget it to put it on the web page. <laughs> We will. So f the URL at the end of this lecture, I will put the, um, the DNS fingerprinting tool um, from the summer school up there too. And the DNS fingerprinting as described by Der Bernstein is available in Nessus, but there are also other tools. For example, DNS finger, which was published on the dark lab um, mailing list. Um, there's somewhat related THC bind info. Um, DNS finger has the interesting property um, that it is, I, I think, was it remotely exploitable or not? No, you could, you could crash it remotely, but you couldn't exploit it. Um, but with DNS finger, we show up some interesting things. Um, here you see that DNS <laughs> finger is still early alpha. Um, the version string with the brackets in it, it's a bug in the tool. Um, Nmap can also do some DNS fingerprinting and it's correctly identifying um, this DNS server as ISC bind. Um, here again, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, Net Cologne identifies itself, if you look for the version string, uh, as Net Cologne is a big internet provider in Cologne, um, as Net Cologne name server. So I think, how lame is that? Take a stock bind, as we've seen, bind 923, and just rename it as net cologne name server. I think the ISC um, could sue them for mislabeling. You know, you, you can't, you don't think so? I think it's a BSD license which explicitly claims that you don't have the, are not allowed to claim that's your software. But nevertheless, I think they won't do, but I think it's extremely lame by the Net Cologne people. Um, <laughs> we can be sure of that. Yeah, but as told with DNS finger, if you go around the net and just fingerprint random machines, things like that happen. Um, I got scared and stopped using that software. Okay, and there's FPDNS. <laughs> oh, I should tell you, you should use the microphone um, if you're asking something. I'm very glad I'm not being told that I should repeat your questions, which I forget all the time. Okay, um, there's also FPDNS, which is a quite decent tool. It seems still to be maintained. It uses a decision tree. That means it doesn't throw all possible tests at the server and then um, analyzes the results, but use only the special tests used to decide is it that version or this group of versions or that group of versions and then um, uses handcrafted this 
tests for to do, finally come to the result that it's a certain server. Um, the problem is that decision trees are very hard to update. So if you want to add another server to that decision tree, um, you might end up with a total rewrite of the tool. Um, it's available at, from Sweden, and it's a good tool. Um, output look, looks like this. Um, I just tried a lot of servers, and wherever I knew um, the, the, the results were correct, although with certain, problem, certain servers there were certain problems with this Q0T, Q0T, and so on. But all in all, it's the nicest DNS fingerprinting tool um, to have. It also gives you information if it's a just a normal DNS server, uh, or a DNS server which publishes information, or also works as a DNS cache allowing you to do recursive queries on there. Okay, and a very interesting thing which hasn't been researched that much to my knowledge up to now is multicast DNS. Um, there are several names, it's market it's und under um, Apple probably is most famous with the name Rendezvous, um, IP version 4 LL local link, uh, zero conf, multicast DNS. There's a nice web page at dot local org describing the whole thing. And especially Macs are extremely chatty um, when speaking multicast DNS. Um, multicast DNS is happening on port 5353. Um, if, if you just try to use um, a DNS querying tool, it doesn't work out. Um, you basically don't, can't use the local address, but if you use the multicast address on your machine, you, you get an answer. Cold cut local is the multicast DNS name of my machine. Um, and you see in there is a lot of information, for example, the model number, it's a power book, three, version five, the operating system number, the exact version of the multicast DNS software, all kinds of IP, um, of IP version four and version six records. Um, if you ask for other names, identifying other um, services on that notebook, you get information that there's an SSH day running, um, the name of the machine, cold cut, um, the MAC address of the machine, um, but also, um, for example, the, the version of my iPhoto software and iTunes software, and if you can request things there, um, lots of stuff. Um, one thing is that seemingly, since it's multicast um, on a multicast local network, you can't do that over the internet. Um, but it would be extremely nifty if somebody looks deeper into that and if one could get all this information, like MAC address and installed iPhoto and iTunes software and so on over the internet. Ah, that again, that's the information from my Airport Express which also sends out a lot of stuff. And more and more information available via multicast DNS. Chat information if I'm online. Um, multicast DNS, the draft of the protocol says um, that all the information um, should basically um, check, or the servers should check if the TTL is still with 255, um, and so to be sure that the information is not requested from a machine which is several hops away. That, that's basically um, the main obstacle in using multicast DNS over the internet to get information out of a machine. There may be ways to get around that in the implementation by Apple. Okay, something completely different is Ike scan. Uh, I think we're now we're getting somewhat short on time. Um, in many scenarios, um, if you are looking to a uh, company which has hardened their internet 
border you have SMTP because they need that to get mail. You might have HTTP if they don't host the websites somewhere externally. And you have their virtual private networking way uh, connections and IPsec stuff. And there often the Ike port is open. Um, and Ike scan, oops, Ike scan is an interesting tool. Um, I think it was published this spring, or is it older? Uh, I have no idea. Okay, it's, it's not that old. Um, and it can fingerprint the Ike protocol implementations used to um, do the IPsec setup. So that's quite interesting stuff. If, uh, even if a company is very well hardened, you might be able with um, Ike scan to find at least out the software of the VPN router, and that might point a stepping stone to get further into the company, or at least um, if you write a, have to write a report on that to impress them, we know that your firewall one version that that is very well configured. Uh, okay, there are several tools. Um, we have now seen tools which were only for single protocol, several tools who try to integrate that. Probably the first one was VMAP, um, which does more or less banner grabbing um, in a little bit sophisticated way. Um, the, if you want to test that on macOS, you need a patch available at that URL. Um, AMAP is from the same people and much more advanced. And finally, NMAP, since version 3.5, has um, application layer fingerprinting too. Um, a short look at AMAP um, running against a server. And the information isn't that detailed. Uh, before, we did banner grabbing, as you might remember, on that machine and got a lot more information than that this might be an open SSH daemon on the SSH part, um, but that might be just a problem that the fingerprint database isn't that um, well developed and that big. Um, AMAP has a concept of triggers, so it sends certain information to ports like user AMAP or hello AMAP, um, and then has a database where it, um, where the replies to that triggers are mapped to certain servers. So, for example, oh, that's small. Um, so, um, a good example is for um, the, the finger. Um, these are the replies sent by different finger servers um, when being requested some more or less random string by AMAP. Um, for, for the HTTP servers, the error message is fingerprinted, or since the triggers also contain HTTP requests, um, even more is fingerprinted, like part of the um, HTML page, in, as you see in the last line, where the JET direct default answer, answer <laughs> to a request uh, one of the requests AMAP sends is non-supported in the title. Um, NMAP works quite similarly, um, get, gets better results. Now, NMAP again, ag running against the same server, you see it identifies the SSH protocol, or the SSH server, for example, much m more detailed. Um, but then again, it's wrong. I'm quite sure that's not VUFTPD running there. Um, again, because I know the guy running the machine and he would never do that. He would and because the version is wrong, there is no VUFTPD 6. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do they come to put that in the fingerprint file then? I have no idea. I read wrong. Uh, but it looks. Uh, Pardon? Yeah, it looks like yeah. a combination of VUFTPD <laughs> and, and BSD one. Okay. Um, there's a quite long explanation by Fyodor on the NMAP version scanning, it, how it works. Um, basically, it's again the concept of triggers, um, which are sent on certain conditions, and then matching for the answers. Um, so, for example, you see if it's 
Welcome to pure FTPD. Um, <laughs> Nmap assumes that it is a pure FTPD there uh, and sends again more FTP requests there to further identify um, the version. Um, the Nmap um, application layer profile is very huge and because of the massive use of Perl regular expressions or Perl like regular expressions, it's no fun to read. Um, but it's quite educational to understand what's happening there and to look into that. Um, for example, um, with clear text protocols, it's somewhat still fun, but they also um, use, have fingerprints in there for binary protocols like SQL Server and DNS. Oh, that's another part of the probe file. Okay. Um, oh, that is from the slides um, of advanced techniques. We won't go into that. Um, then you, you might be able to fingerprint, fingerprint attempts. Um, or you might be able to use the fingerprint databases to fall fingerprint tools. Since you know exactly what they are looking for, um, you can send them what you want them to see. The most famous example is probably HoneyD. Um, in the lecture before we heard about the IP stack identity module for the Linux kernel, which somewhat works the same way, um, HoneyD can simulate one or more IP stacks. I think it was tested with several 10,000 IP stacks emulated at the same time. And it uses the databases of fingerprinting tools to emulate the IP stacks. So basically it gets the databases of Nmap, Xprobe, and POF. Um, and you'll say, I want to use, uh, simulate something which has the same fingerprint for Nmap, Xprobe, and POF. Um, and, and then it adjusts its IP stack behavior, it's no real IP stack, uh, accordingly to look as one of the operating systems you simulate there. Um, we, we try to um, take that some further and said we are more interested in applications and many people are trying to simulate applications with HoneyD by writing shell scripts which are started by HoneyD if somebody tries to connect to a certain port and then use shell commands to simulate a web server or a mail server um, and we said why shouldn't we um, turn around the, or take the approach for the HoneyD takes for the IP stack and use it for the application layer and basically Ilya did a proof of concept code in one night you, you know he wasn't allowed to sleep during the summer school um, to use the database by VMAP um, and use it, attach it to HoneyD to simulate the services VMAP knows. And so when scanning VMAP, it's exactly um, was the same way as NMAP, POF, and XPROP. It saw exactly the replies it was looking for. Uh, do you want to further elaborate on the problems or so? Or? Um, it was AMAP and not oh. VMAP. Oh. That's, that's very good. Okay, um, then I took a student and thought, oh, he, he might need half a year to replicate that work of Ilya and gave him VMAP um, to, to do the emulation. And so to my astonishment, we now are able, if I drag out Ilya's code, to foil VMAP and AMAP. Very good. Um, so we still have to add NMAP um, to that. The whole process, especially with the NMAP, is quite difficult because there are so many regular expressions in the database and you basically have to find something which matches this regular expression but also matches the fixed strings used by VMAP and AMAP. Um, but well, there are computer science faculty, people should know how to do that. Um, the, the initial code now for AMAP simulation is written by a student at the Laboratory for Dependable Distributed Systems, Thomas Appel, um, and he was so friendly to publish it. Um, so you can download it at core23 and you and this URL. Um, it's also linked on the page with the slides. We'll see in the end. Um, and then simulate happily everything for VMAP. Um, we'll come up with more code in that direction to automatically simulate services um, with HoneyD 
applications. You can expect quite a lot of stuff more we have in the pipeline at the laboratory there. Okay, um, in, in the summer school, after we did um, three hours of lecture on fingerprinting, we were told that we are so stupid and doing it all wrong and have to rethink the whole process um, because fingerprints or the, the probes sent and the answers sent back, uh, the probes sent are more or less ha handcrafted and then the answers are collected and it's very manual process like a, a cottage industry or craftsmen um, and we should look into others who fingerprint. For example, the people attacking an anonymity systems and they look for traffic patterns and stuff like that and you can't do that by hand. Um, so George Danesis put his code during this, uh, put his code where his mouth is during the summer school and hacked a proof of concept implementation. Um, and this thing is really amazing. It um, eats away all your computing power. We, we now have to rewrite it to use distributed computing. Um, it does uh, something which is called feature extraction, which basically you throw in um, uh, some thousand features like HTTP headers or SMTP handshakes. Um, we did a test with, we basically t dumped the probes used by SMTP scan and used them then with this um, cross-core tool to find the most similar ones or to, to put it as input in there. So you have a di dictionary with headers of that and um, then this tool automatically extracts the byte sequences which most strongly um, distinguish the different headers and group them. Then you still have the problem um, to identify which of this bunch is which server. For example, with HTTP headers, you might just use the server header because you can be quite sure that there may be people who change their server header to say something different, um, but not the majority of web servers. So if you um, fingerprint some 10,000 HTTP ser um, server headers, CrossCore will group so, uh, some of them together and if of one group, um, let's say 20,000 say they are internet information server version 6 and another 80 say they are Apache, you can be quite sure that these 80 are patched in internet information servers, although that's very, quite, uh, very difficult with the internet information server. Um, this is example output of CrossCore. Um, even if it's already built its database, um, it takes quite a long time to, um, to start up. Here it's only with a very short database um, of I think 500 or so headers. Um, if, if you start it it's, and there is no database, it rebuilds it automatically. Um, but I, I wanted to present it with more interesting data for the Congress, but after uh, ah, 20 or 30 hours on my notebook crunching away with that stuff, I stopped the process. Um, and then it generates output like this. It's very interesting because it's, it's not handcrafted. Nobody would come to the idea that the content length header is the best one to distinguish servers. Um, CrossCore thinks it is. Um, but these are the features it identifies certain servers with. For example, the ASP session ID probably is something good to um, identify. And then it says what the top matches are for this server. And in fact, they are right, it, it was an internet information server version 6. In fact, it was exactly the same server as was before used as a database in this file out 199. And the charm of that is that it can work with other protocols too. Basically everything which is al always the same or at least likely the same if you repeat it over, over and over again and to, which you can dump in text files for cross-core to, uh, um, to analyze. Yeah, um, this is a slide we came up after we started drinking beer. Things that broke while development. Oh, 
even the T's. <laughs> um, it, it was quite interesting. If you do fingerprinting, you, you send servers borderline cases, commands without that usual and unmeant um, to be sent.